The title of this talk is Negotiating Identities in Contexts of Small-Scale Multilingualism, and my specific focus will be on relational identity. In this talk, I will have two main goals. The first one is to clarify that what I call here relational identity is not to be confused with relationality in interaction. And the second goal is to show the relevance of this concept for the study of small-scale multilingualism. Relational identity is not a common term in sociolinguistic literature. Understandably, the closest concept is that of identity as a fundamentally relational phenomenon. This is best captured by Buchholz and Holt's relationality principle that says identities are intersubjectively constructed through several often overlapping complementary relations. And also identity in interaction as a fundamentally relational phenomenon is also at the heart of influential theories such as audience referee design, accommodation theories, and in general, research focusing on style. However, these are not what I mean by relational identity. And in order to make clear why relational identity is not captured by the concept of relationality, I must introduce a distinction between identity targets on the one hand and relational effects on the other. Let me try to clarify what I mean through an example. So the situation is, we are in a bus in Nairobi. The conductor, meaning the man issuing tickets, walks through the aisle and asks a passenger, a well-dressed young man, if he paid his bus fare. So the conductor insists and asks where he is going. And the passenger replies that he's going to the Jerusalem housing estate. The interaction has been in Swahili so far, which is the lingua franca used by most people in the streets of Nairobi. But at this point, perhaps disappointed by the passenger's dismissive be behavior, the conductor switches to English, Kenya's formerly colonial language, and rebukes the passenger, saying, you must always say clearly and loudly where you're going to alight, okay? Very quickly, and without aiming to completeness nor detail, you can sketchily represent this switch as follows. The conductor selects English because that is an index of a locally salient population that is locally known to also have a number of other associated features. One or some of these features are salient and effective, so to say, at the level of the relations between the two men. This is the key point that allows me to introduce the distinction between identity targets on the one hand and relational effects on the other. The point is that the bus conductor's initial move is not inherently immediately relational per se, Rather, it is some of the possible orders of indexicality generates that produce relational effects. It is not the identity target that is relational. It is its ideological implications that, ha that have effects at the level of relations, negotiation of identities. So in this case, we see that relationality between identities is indirect, mediated through what Silverstein would call n plus one order indexicals, or n plus one plus one order indexicals. Far from being peculiar to this specific interaction, this pattern reveals what I would say is the default way to approach relationality in sociolinguistics. And in its turn, this also reveals how identity is being considered by sociolinguists. Age, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, social class, university affiliation, profession or occupation, geographic, region, institutional affiliation, social status. And in these and a few others are the features that are normally discussed by sociolinguists and linguist anthropologists when they deal with identity representations. Underpinning all this is the assumption that for a person to have an identity, is to be cast into a category with associated characteristics or, or features, as Antaki and Widicom put it. There are endless examples confirming that in sociolinguistic literature, identity has been considered to be coterminous with what sociologists call categorical identification. However, as I'll try to show in a second, this is not the whole story about what types of identity can be represented by interactions, by people, by speakers. Sociological literature is helpful to understand what I mean here. In an influential and very important article entitled Beyond Identity, Brubaker and Cooper, two sociologists, 
help us name the two basic types of identity making processes that are available to us humans. On the one hand, as we've just seen, there is categorical identification that is a way of understanding oneself and others that is based on membership in a class of persons who share one or more categorical attributes like age, gender, and all the other features that we have seen. On the other hand, there is relational identification, which obtains when one identifies oneself or another person by position in a concrete web of interpersonal named relations, like parent, children, senior brother, junior brother, teacher, pupil, or coworker, coworker. I summarize the main difference between the two ways of self and other identification in this table. Let's now try to sum up with some takeaway points. First of all, categor categorical targets have relational effects at some point of their indexical steps, uh, that is indexical orders. So they produce mediated or indirect relationality. Relational targets on their, uh, on their turn have immediate inherent relational effects. So they produce direct relationality. So describing the first two points above, is possible only if one differentiates identity targets from relational effects. So my claim is that this is an improvement for the analysis of the production of social indexical meaning in interaction, as it allows to both accommodate different processes of identity construction, that is categorical versus relational identification, and at the same time, accommodate the different types of relationality in interaction that these two distinct processes engender that is indirect versus direct relationality. One could wonder, okay, good, but is this really necessary? I mean, sociolinguistics seems to have worked just fine without this further complication. So why introducing it in the first place? Let me try to quickly, to quickly tell you why it's needed. In state-based urban societies of strangers, the understanding of self and others through categorical identification has progressively become more prominent at the expense of processes of relational identification as several sociologists have identified. These societies are the main focus of sociolinguists. So it is understandable that they specialized in the analysis of categorical identities and indirect relationalities. It is only when research is conducted in non-urban, non-late modern contexts that this epistemological limitation emerges more clearly. It is when labels such as solidarity or intimacy would seem to account for the majority of people's choices in interaction that one realizes that the labels themselves are not analytically adequate. The point is that relational identity targets and the direct relationalities they engender give rise to indexical ramifications of a type that sociolinguistics has not very much focused upon. The study of small scale multilingualism is requiring such move. Let's now get to the second part of this paper. The word fungum is located at the, rightly in, right in the middle of the so-called uh, Sub-Saharan Fragmentation Belt, that is a macro region in, what, in which one can find about 80% of Africa's linguistic diversity. And the Wolfungo, right in the middle of the red square, is along the border between Cameroon and Nigeria. With a density of about one language per uh, 30 square, square kilometers, Lower Fungum represents an extreme in the linguistically already highly diverse Cameroonian grass fields. This map represents the linguist's perspective um, uh, on the languages of Lower Fungum, uh, which recognizes between seven and nine local languages and the number of local dialects, so to say, of such languages, like in the case of Mungbam, the blue squares, which is considered as including five local varieties. By contrast, this is the map representing the perspective of the locals. Each village has its own distinctive talk, according to local language ideologies, which stress the one-to-one -one correspondence between villages and languages. In this and in the following slide, I am providing some basic uh, information concerning Lower Fungum, uh, both uh, from an ethnographic and historical point of view, as well as from a linguistic point of view. Please pause the presentation so as to read through the text.
I hope you were able to download the handout where I included the two examples I would like to discuss. In fact, I'll discuss only example two in somewhat more detail, but I wanted to also add example one just to make you see that this is a common pattern, not just something very strange. Example one and two depict very similar situations because in both cases, the two main participants are men of different age. They can potentially communicate without problems in no less than three local languages plus Cameroon Pidgin English. The younger man following the, lo the local etiquette accommodates the older man by starting the interaction in the latter's primary language. And accidentally, this is boo in both examples. At some point in the interaction, the older man makes some inquisitive remarks, example one, or strongly asserts his seniority, as in example two, on the younger man. And this is highlighted in yellow in, the, in both examples. The younger man reacts by switching to another language. And this is uh, highlighted in red. And the older man is offended and their interaction comes to an end. So this is the pattern that we can, that you can see in both example one and two. And I would kindly ask you to, to look through your handouts. <clears throat> For reasons of time, it's impossible for me to go through the, the examples with you. Uh, attention. I would just focus a little bit more on, on example two. In the initial table, this one, I put the available information about the languages that are shared by the two main interactants in which both are fully proficient with these. Here, I also added some basic information about the possible relation-based indexicality of these languages for each speaker, at least as far as the available data allow us to, to see. So getting back to Y and O, their dialogue shows a first friction already at lines six, seven, when talking about American palm nuts that only proactive and modern farmers uh, have in, in Lower Fugum, the two men entered in a sort of veiled antagonism. Okay, one says, it is American palm nut that I'm eating, and the, one, and, and the younger man replies, do I lack American palm nuts? This friction reaches a first acme at line 15 and 16. Yellow I highlight. When O, the older man, actually screams to the younger man, telling him to sit down and eat, calling him a child. At line 17, we see the younger man's reaction, that is code switching and social distancing. It is interesting to see that this altercation continues in another location, and here, the younger man really brings it to its extreme when he speaks, it's here, when he speaks to O, he doesn't use boo, but aba. Okay, He's, the younger man here is using aba, aba, and the older man replies in boo. But he goes even further um, because he uses boo to speak to a chicken instead of the older man. Reportedly, the older man was furious. So how should we analyze these interactions? Accommodation theory would seem to work, right? Social etiquette prompts the young man to accommodate the old man, and feeling that his face is being threatened, the young man seeks a relatively soft way to distance himself from the old man through code switching. However, ethnographic knowledge on the local societies and detailed biographic data about the interactants show that this interpretation is only seemingly appropriate. In fact, it can be misleading because by giving a quick answer, it doesn't prompt the researcher to look for details as to the actual workings of these language ideologies. Very importantly, what remains untapped through the adoption of this interpretation is the possibility that these moves are significant at the level of negotiation of identities qua relational identities. So concerning the ethnography, the ethnographic information that we have on Lower Fungum, we can say that traditionally, these are kind of gerontocratic societies, meaning that these are societies where age plays a key role in the distribution of authority that normally goes to older people. So while elders are highly respected regardless of their provenance, only interpersonal relationships that are close enough grant them the right to exert actual authority on younger people. When such interpersonal closeness is foregrounded, the elders can behave in ways that one would normally expect from a parent, that is, rebuke, ask for special favors, etc. As for other information that we have, 
the young man in both, in both uh, examples has a specific personal name by which he is called in the older man's village. This means that he is a full member of that group and this naming strategy is common in the area. By representing himself as a Bu man, the young man stresses his position within the Bu web of interpersonal and interfamily relations out of the several other village-based webs he's part of. So here we can see that the Bu-based web is the one in which the mutual relationship between the young and the old man is closest. It is only when both are positioned in this web that a Boo elder can exert authority, that is, play the part of a parent over a younger person. So why is accommodation inadequate? Accommodation is inadequate because Bu is not just the old man's home language, but rather it is the language activating the web in which the two men's mutual relationship is closest. So by starting the interaction in Bu, the younger man is representing himself as socially positioned under the older man. Defining this as an instance of accommodation would bleach the important relational workings that underpin the whole interaction. In order to escape from the older man's intrusion, and this is the second reason why accommodation is inadequate, the younger man switches to the language associated with his own father. We can view this move as a way to position himself as son of another man, therefore subtracting himself from the authority of the boo old man. This is much more than just social distancing through divergence. So if we wanted to give a graphic representation of the interaction, we can do this. So the two men have three local codes available, Abba, Pu, and Mundabli. This is especially in example two. In example one, they have different languages, but same pattern. They have multiple languages in which they're both fully proficient. The younger man selects Bu, which is the older man's home language, and the one that this foregrounds the closest relationship among the two men, the one in which the seniority of the older man becomes especially salient. He can behave as if he were the father of the younger man. The younger man gets angry and switches to another local code, one in which the relationship with the older man is not too close. In fact, however, by foregrounding the, his Abara identity, the younger man is also representing him as being son of another man. It's like he's saying to the older man, you're not my father. I respect the paternal authority of another man, not yours. So, and in example two, we, we also see a very creative way to deploy the local language ideologies as the younger man, in order to further stress his anger and disrespect for the older man, speaks in Bu with a chicken and in Abba with the older man. So implying that he recognizing the, recognizes the chicken to be closer to him than the older man is. This has the effect of symbolically, symbolically breaking the relationship between the two men. Let's try to quickly compare this process with what we saw in the Nairobi bus example. So in the Nairobi bus example, we saw that relationality was mediated through one or more of the features associated with the locally salient population speakers of English. So obtaining what I called indirect relationality. Can we consider example two to follow the same indexical logic? No, this is not what happens in example two for, for one thing, there are no known categorical features associated with being a boo man. Simply because being a boo man is not a social category. It is a relational identity target. So it indexes a concrete network of people and as such directly embodies interpersonal relationships that are implied by the position that the speaker occupies within that network. And this results in direct in direct relationality. Are there no orders of indexicality involved here? Just very quickly, there are, but they are of very different nature as compared to the indexical orders that we are most accustomed to, because this may be ties with individual or family specific information, gossips, past problems, and let's say relationship based intertextuality. Conclusions, very quickly, some conclusions. The phenomena I briefly illustrated can be fully analyzed only if one deconstructs the universality of categorical identification. 
it's to be noted that considering the concept of identity as coterminous with categorical identity, as influential models seem to imply, like in Irvine and Gold's 2000 and Buchholz and Hall, is a form of ethnocentrism. If this is done, if the universality of, of categorical identification is, de is deconstructed, a twofold gap in sociolinguistic scholarship becomes evident. How much work has been done on language in society, in societies that are not urban nor late modern, but nonetheless have been super diverse for centuries? How many times concepts such as solidarity or intimacy have been used to label and leave unexplained what I claim would be best considered direct relationalities? The indexicalities of relational identity targets are still largely unexplored. This, to me, is the main opportunity and challenge offered by the study of small-scale multilingualism. Before it's too late, however, because contexts of small-scale multilingualism are endangered ecologies. Thank you for your attention.